Well, good morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for taking the time out to be curious about curiosity and what it can unlock for your teams. Uh, this is going to be uh, a wild ride full of uh, a couple stories, some uh, bite-sized applications, and uh, then some insights that you can use to level up your team. So we are talking about curiosity because for a healthy, high-performing product team, curiosity is a compulsion. It's this um, relentless drive to learn, you know, where that learning sparks action and creates new and unique value faster than the competition. So those teams know just how powerful curiosity is and how easy it is to lose, especially as your company grows. So if you don't fight for it, if you don't fight for curiosity, it disintegrates, it atrophies and your best product people start thinking about leaving and your product drifts. So here's where we're heading uh, today. First, we're gonna do kind of like a shared understanding on what I mean uh, by curiosity. Like, why should we care? Uh, we'll use a, a framework. It's just a little simple two by two grid to kind of help visualize this. Uh, and then we're gonna zoom into the product life cycle. So some of the dangers that uh, pop up as we shift from discovery to delivery. Uh, and where we're kind of starting to be tempted to stop asking questions. Uh, and then last, we're going to unpack the five ingredients that kind of help build uh, and keep this culture of, of curiosity uh, and some super simple practical things that you can start today. So a uh, little bit about me. Uh, I'm Evan Michener, head of product management at Full Story. For those who have not used Full Story before, Full Story is a, a digital experience intelligence platform. Uh, so we're combining quantitative data and analytics with the qualitative. So watching real user sessions, uh, heat maps, journey maps. Uh, and because of that unique pairing, Full Story is uh, kind of the ultimate curiosity playground. Uh, so I've held product management roles across all sorts of industries, B2B, SaaS, uh, Atlassian, and Full Story, and then uh, B2C across financial services and travel and retail companies of all stages, sizes, uh, startup of three uh, to a retailer of 120,000 people. I just really love working with product teams. Uh, that's what's behind this conversation today because curiosity is core to our DNA as product people. It takes some work to keep it alive though. So to kick us off, quick story time. Uh, my wife and I have three kids, uh, our, our middle kiddo, uh, our son is eight uh, and has uh, what you would call kind of a naturally high sense of curiosity. <laughs> um, so the other day we're at the library here and uh, super peaceful, out of the corner of his eye, through the glass door, he sees this fish pond outside. So we live near the ocean. He's been super curious about pretty much everything water related uh, lately. So this pond catches his interest. His curiosity is peaked. And he is off like a lightning bolt, dead sprint through the door, out the pond. And then all of a sudden, this peaceful silence of the library kind of erupts because this door was an emergency exit door. <laughs> so after this all settles down, so it's a great moment, uh, kind of encouraging his curiosity and then, of course, reminding him, you know, uh, to read the red signs all over this door that say emergency exit alarm will sound. Um, so it's, it's curiosity that drives him to sprint through that door and as I was uh, putting this talk together, I asked him, asked our son to define curiosity, kind of coming off of this uh, library experience. So he defines curiosity as to wonder, to wonder. And as I thought about how that applies to product, there's a layer in there that I love, this kind of element of joy, you know, truly caring about something enough to go learn and sprint after it. You know, how often do we really spend time kind of wondering about our users and customers? Uh, and then I asked him what he was going to do after the pond. So after he gets whatever he thinks he was going to get after uh, he learned what was in that pond. And so he looks at me and says, the knowledge could have come in handy later in life, <laughs> which is 
a great answer for an eight-year-old, uh, somewhat insufficient when we think about kind of curiosity in the context of product and product teams, obviously. So this spirit of wonder is beautiful, this kind of compulsion to learn, to sprint through the door. We're going to keep that element but we need to pair it with intentionality and in action, knowing you know, which signals to chase down and actually doing something with those learnings to move your product forward. So here's, here's how I've sketched this out when it comes to curiosity. Um, we're gonna use this little two by two baseline uh, to kind of baseline our conversation today. Um, I'll do a quick voiceover and then as I do this, think about your own teams here. Where are you as a product person, where your company is? So the lower left corner, this is apathy. So first of all, apathy as a product person is poisonous. This is effectively the lack of caring about the product, the customer, the metrics. You know, maybe this is over time, a lack of caring kind of just becomes the norm. Apathy is kind of what you hope happens to your competitors and pray never happens in your own org. Uh, we don't wanna be here as product people. We don't want our teams to be here as product leaders. So let's move to the right. Uh, I bet if we were going to do a, a quick poll here, my hunch is that many might be in this category. We're shipping and executing and delivering with excellence. Some of you uh, might even kind of be at the top of your game here. Super laser focused, almost myopically focused, perhaps. Uh, strong sense of purpose, clear finish line in mind. Uh, typically, the teams here are kind of consistently delivering on time under budget. And this might be what your organization rewards, and they should, because so much of product is on that follow through. Um, product leaders, I'm going to talk directly to you for a minute. You help set the pace through your priorities and questions. And so, if this is your team or organization, Congratulations on encouraging this high velocity bias towards action. And are your team so focused that they might miss other valuable opportunities? You might miss the warning signs in the data. Um, we're going to look at how this manifests in the product life cycle here in a minute. But this posture is a perfect start to potentially del delivering the, exactly the wrong thing because your blinders are on. So the trick is we want, uh, we, we kind of understand that bottom right-hand corner, action. We understand how to motivate and reward action. We're setting ambitious goals and clear deadlines, um, priorities, get rowing in the same direction. And it's that inertia that can be so hard to overcome. But your learning muscles here are atrophying and, and kind of over time, maybe you slowly slip into the apathy zone. If you don't fight to stay curious about the customer and their needs and whether you're actually focused on the right problem, your product will drift. And so curiosity, constant learning is core to what we do in product. This is not easy, especially in the face of these pressures and, and deadlines. So how do we fight here? What do we need to kind of layer into an environment like this? In that upper left-hand corner, this product manager or product team is wondering through data and customer conversations. This is kind of the spirit, the raw spirit of exploration. It's alive and well. You're running through the emergency exit door. Now, what are they curious about? This could be anything. They're uh, often learning in uh, spurts and sprints, you know, loads of um, questions that result in uh, scrambled priorities, half finished designs. So curiosity here needs to translate to clarity and action, direction. So the idea or insight is just a part. And then of course the magic is on the follow through. What we want is that upper right hand corner. So we want to blend that high curiosity with the bias towards action. And that's what we're just going to call that intentional curiosity. It's um, caring so deeply that you can't let go. It's that relentless drive to learn and to put those insights into motion uh, to create new value with speed. So what does this look like? 
How do you blend that uh, high curiosity with that bias towards action to move with purpose? So one story I've seen play out over and over again is actually during the product life cycle itself. Does this image resonate with you? You know, you're at the start of discovery, you're on fire, you find some new insight, you find a spark, you're talking with customers, you're digging through the data, you're sizing up competition, you're wondering with direction and intentionality. And so as you move into validation and delivery, though, your aperture narrows and shifts, especially if you're under pressure. And so just like a, a, a camera lens, you're letting less light in. Your sense of curiosity wanes to um, make space for an increased focus on delivery. Um, there's a, a scene from the movie Vacation uh, where uh, Clark and Ellen Griswold uh, get to the Grand Canyon on their way to Wally World. Uh, Clark is short on cash here, so this is kind of a long story, but he spends basically about two seconds soaking in the scenery. Uh, and then he's rushing the family back to the car to kind of get on the road. The point is, if you haven't seen this movie, <laughs> the point is you've got this majestic set of data in front of you. And you might miss the signals and the warning signs because you're too focused on delivering. You're already on the road. You're shipping no matter what. Uh, one of our uh, uh, product managers here at Full Story, Greg, asked uh, this really thought-provoking question the other day about uh, alphas and betas, you know, these are the kind of early releases, releases and versions that we uh, often release to a subset of our customers. Um, he asked whether we were treating them uh, as a checkpoint or as a checkbox. Are we pausing during delivery to, you know, be curious enough still about the data during those stages? Or are we just staying on the highway at, at full speed? Is that inertia of delivery. It's so hard to overcome. It's hard to be that person to leave, you know, some user research session and then ask, wait, does this still make sense? And so, uh, by the way, the fact that Greg even asked this question is a reflection of the culture we're trying to constantly work on and, and build up here at Full Story. This is the culture of curiosity balancing, moving with urgency, with pausing on principle. He's looking at our launches and asking, when was the last time we got into an alpha or beta and didn't continue on because of data or user feedback? I would ask you the same question. So part of the kind of endless challenge and joy of product work is maintaining these two kind of diametrically opposed mindsets at all time, this passionate zealot, you know, th this thing we're building will change the world and the objective critic asking uh, the right hard questions with confidence, exercising curiosity. So think about what you're working on right now. What new learning could cause you to stop mid-flight? Anything? Are you curious enough? to check your assumptions as you deliver. Your product leaders, are you allowing your product teams to check those assumptions? So let's go back to our framework here. Uh, we know where we want to be. It's this upper right-hand corner. We want question askers. We want action when we find those sparks. And so how do we get there? How do we stay there? How do we fight for curiosity. Um, there's five ingredients that I found in, in talking with product teams. We're going to run through each one of these. First one is empathy. To be curious, you first have to care. There's two aspects here. One is understanding the customer's problems. And then the second piece of this is viewing the, the product through their eyes. So understanding their problems. And uh, when I say that, I mean like really understanding their problems, deeply understanding their day and how your product fits into that day. And then the second piece is viewing the product through their eyes. Um, I was talking uh, with a, a product manager a few weeks ago who works on software for doctors, the medical industry. 
And so, as you might imagine, one of her biggest challenges is viewing the product through the doctor's eyes and actually using the software. So things like usability testing and research, all of that is obviously much harder in that type of environment. You've got busy doctors, tons of privacy issues, obviously. So they have to fight to stay curious to kind of build that empathy and get signals and insights. Uh, on the flip side, I know there's probably a lot of SaaS folks here. Uh, maybe you work on a tool or a product that you actually are using in your day to day. So what a double edged sword here, because this can almost be the polar opposite. You're using that product all day. How easy is it to just gloss over speed bumps and hiccups in that workflow? When you drive the same highway all day, you're on autopilot. And so while your product is the center of your day, it's usually just a slice of your customer's day. So viewing the product through their eyes becomes kind of equally important in this case, just for a different reason. And so building empathy for the customer's problems and then viewing the product through their eyes. Here are two things you can look into this week really quick, both of which uh, we could probably unpack and uh, spend maybe a whole other session on. But first thing is a journey map. So I, I'm not talking about when a customer logs in, goes to the page you want them to go to. I'm talking about like the 30 minutes before they log in. What are they doing? What are they feeling as they log in? What pressure are they under? And then the 30 minutes after they log out, what tool do they use next? Who are they talking to? And so a journey map here can help. Uh, because it's this visual depiction of the customer journey that kind of helps shine a light on opportunity to invest in uh, as you understand the, the holistic experience the, the user's going through. So there's two ways to start this uh, quantitative, quantitatively. So Full Story has a way to build the customer journey and then qualitatively with user studies to really understand what's happening outside of your product, how the user's feeling throughout the journey and day. The goal of this is just to build a deep understanding of that customer and then evangelize it within your teams. So as you look at that journey, another dimension, uh, another dimension here is clarifying the jobs to be done. So how well do you understand the job the user has actually hired you for? What are they trying to do? And then how well does the marketing team know that or the sales team? So jobs to be done, so it's a great way to kind of illustrate what your customers are actually buying from you. And, uh, you know, it's usually not your product, but what your product helps them do. So at Full Story, we use personas like product manager or marketer. Uh, we like to talk about making our data accessible to different teams in different ways. Uh, and then we have a short list of kind of the primary jobs those teams are trying to accomplish. Uh, there's a list of tasks with, with each job, and then we spend time with those users and teams to really understand where we're succeeding and then where we still have some work to do. So empathy, understanding the customer's problems, viewing the product through their eyes. This is just really caring. Second one here is trust. So giving voice to our curiosity, this might come as a surprise, but giving voice to our curiosity carries risk. How safe is it to ask questions in your organization, to challenge something in mid-flight? So first, it's important to acknowledge that uh, even in the healthiest environments, we are still human, which means it's risky to put ourselves out there and ask questions. The difference, though, between a high-trust and low-trust environment is that there is intentional reinforcement that questions are not just okay, but they're expected. Surely someone has thought of this question before. I'm going to sound dumb. It's not worth interrupting the, the flow of this conversation with a question or this isn't my area or my lane. I'll stay out of this. Or if I ask this question, they're going to get really defensive. Giving voice to our curiosity carries this risk. And slowly, curiosity and caring disintegrates. So trust is an unlock and an outcome of a culture of curiosity. So it's this loop that kind of builds and builds. When you have a team that feels safe, 
Their minds are not consumed with calculating the risks of asking a question. So there's two quick ways to put this in motion. One, question reception, which really just means like, let's get a baseline here. So on the receiving end of a question in your team today, do you find that minds are receptive or defensive? Receptive means uh, kind of meeting curiosity with curiosity often. You hear a question that lights up a part of your brain. And defensive looks like armor. Assuming that person is there to kind of take you down a notch. Challenging your decisions. Uh, these little moments of questions are so valuable. Do not let them go to waste, especially for the product leaders here. When you get a hard question, make it clear that you love that question. It's contagious. Second thing here, this is a really simple way to kind of start thinking about asking your questions, especially within your team. It's pairing curiosity with context. That's it. So next time you ask a question, add a little bit of context to disarm and add clarity. So here's an example. Uh, we do this in person and uh, over uh, chat as well. So, um, hey, product manager, curious if you've seen um, any data around kind of the adoption of feature X. Why? I was looking at feature Y this morning and started wondering if we're starting to see some of these same things or the patterns emerge. And all you're doing here is just pairing curiosity with context. It's funny, though, how a little tag of why you're asking helps open up the dialogue. Here's a bonus tip as well. Uh, you know what else, based on my experience, anecdotally, <laughs> is more common in an environment of trust? Humor. And humor also happens to be a fantastic delivery mechanism for curiosity and asking questions. Okay, trust. So you have this kind of bubbling curiosity across your teams. And so trust can help that rise and explode, can bring confidence and voice to that curiosity, or that curiosity can disintegrate and cool kind of as this layer of, of mistrust forms across the surface, squashes creativity and curiosity. So high trust. Next, passion. So if you're passionate about the problem, uh, the surface area, the customer, you're just going to care a lot naturally. You're going to have um, ownership. You're going to feel ownership over that problem space. You're going to be compelled to act, agency to act, accountable for delivering on the goals. Now, the flip side of this though, so take that passion, which is good, and maybe layer in uh, some org changes. Your company's growing. Maybe you're adding a few new people to the mix. And slowly, sometimes that passion kind of morphs into territorialism. And uh, like a weed, you don't really see it growing, but kind of over time, it starts choking innovation and curiosity. And you're seeing uh, questions decrease. You're seeing these lanes emerge. Staying in my lane, stay in your lane. You know, carving out space, this myopia. So the thing about this, <laughs> the customer, your customer, does not care what your lane is. Your customer doesn't care if you're the product manager for checkout on the Android app. So each product person is kind of a player working together for the sake of the customer experience and leaders Speaking to you right now, it is your job to help build context and make it okay to swerve outside of those lanes and ask questions. Uh, if you are struggling to uh, dig up some passion for what you're working on right now, here's a, just a little trick. Connect it to something you do care about. So uh, it sounds simple, but here's what I mean by that. If you spent any time maybe working around uh, neurodiversity, if you're familiar with that term, uh, it's perhaps a topic, again, for a whole other session. But if you've spent time around neurodiversity, you might recognize this little trip, trick because um, in, oftentimes in neurodiverse folks, you're working with an interest-based nervous system rather than an importance-based nervous system. That's a lot of words. What does that mean? So in that case, 
It's important to connect what you're working on that might be important to something that interests you to get the right level of motivation. Interest often trumps importance in that mindset. So this is just a little trick for you to kind of tap into. And so maybe for your day-to-day, I'll illustrate this, uh, maybe you're working on uh, a corner of your mobile app that just, it's, it seems like the world's forgotten about. So my question for you is, what story could you tell yourself to build some passion for this? Maybe you're connecting it to the story you want to tell about your career or, uh, you know, like how, um, how you built magic out of a forgotten corner of the app and drove metrics X, Y, and Z, you know, or uh, maybe it's um, the tech stack. Get curious about the tech. Maybe spend some time with the engineers and come out smarter. You cannot fabricate passion out of thin air, obviously. It's this key characteristic of the best product people, but a key component to encouraging passion is through empathy. So recenter on the customer and the outcomes and the role each person uh, and each team plays in that. So really simple one here, try starting each meeting with a customer quote. For product leaders, if you start to see territorialism, you know, first you're first kind of ask yourself, what is your role in that? Consider shaking things up, hackathons, design sprints, things that kind of get your teams out of their silos, you know, thinking about the user problems uh, rather than these lanes or surface areas. Um, okay, access, access, which means um, easy access to the data and to the customer. So how easy is it for your teams to kind of exercise curiosity? Uh, Sometimes the barriers here are cultural or procedural. Sometimes they're technical. This is one of the top issues we hear about um, at Full Story from our customers, by the way. Our data is a mess. Not sure what the source of truth is. This is access. Uh, This is also a fast way to apathy. Data, insights, the customer, they should all kind of be within an arm's reach for the team. I'll share a, a little ritual we use at, at Full Story often. It's, a, it's an exercise we call one number. Each product manager brings a simple number, usually a piece of data, to our meeting. We popcorn around the room. This is adoption metrics, retention data, progress towards a, a metric of success. It's so simple, but it helps connect dots and encourage curiosity. Always, always generates a huge dialogue. Your data need to be accessible Some of our favorite customer stories at Full Story uh, are about watch parties. Um, Since you can watch user sessions in Full Story, uh, many of our customers take Friday afternoon to kind of pop some popcorn, uh, pick a part of the product, and then observe their users through that experience. They group up at the end to kind of find next steps and smooth out some of those areas of friction. If it seems harder Uh, than it should be to engage directly with your customers, seek to understand internally first. Oftentimes there's legal issues, logistical reasons for that. But if not, my encouragement is to move. You be the one who starts that movement. Get a quick database of these customers, start sharing notes so your teams can connect back to the customer. It should be easy for teams to be curious. That's access. Okay, last, speed. How quickly do we move on new insights and in what way? We want to create new value with speed. So let's say we found some new data, this spark. We've got questions emerging. We're rethinking some assumptions. And you're kind of at this pivotal point here. How much discovery, how much time do we spend answering questions, gaining confidence, and how? So experimentation. This is one of the fastest ways to move with urgency and act on curiosity. Uh, One reason to invest in experimentation is to help reduce the risk involved in building something new. Experimentation can help prioritize and act. So it's not replacing data or research, it's augmenting. So you're quickly moving here from question to action to kind of stay out of that wondering square. 
And you know, by the way, customers' needs and expectations are always changing. Everyone here is trying to figure out what's going on with the economy. You're looking for cost savings, reducing risk. Experimentation is a powerful way to continue to ask and answer questions. And one of the biggest myths is that, is that experimentation is too hard. It would never work at my company. I promise you, you're wrong. The investment is smaller than you think, and the return can be measured in how much risk you're reducing, less time wasted building the wrong thing, and that snowball effect as optimizations build up over time. Okay, <laughs> let's summarize. In high-performing product teams, curiosity is a compulsion. It's this key that unlocks the best thinking. It is a relentless drive to learn where that learning sparks action. It creates new and unique value faster than your competition. So curiosity is a muscle. If you don't work it, the muscle atrophies. So you have to fight for curiosity. We talked about empathy, really caring and understanding the customer. Trust, where it's safe and expected to ask questions, where teams are passionate have easy access to the data and to the customer, and then lastly can move with speed. And that is the place where intentional curiosity flourishes, where creativity reigns. And so product people, as we close here, so much of our job feels like we must know the answers. What's in the sprint? What are the biggest bets for the quarter? How does this fit into annual strategy? You know, where are we going? What's our vision? And you become this action-oriented answering machine. It's habit-forming. I'm challenging you to interrupt the cycle. It is our job to fight for curiosity. Thank you. <laughs>